Okay. Um, thank you all for joining us. I will call this uh, open session uh, budget workshop to order at 11.25 a.m. Uh, the Board of Trustees was previously in an executive session and no action was taken during executive session and there are no action items to be taken uh, here after in open session. I let the record show that Trustees Barry, Decker, Carbone, Botkin, Floyd, Gooden, and Murphy are all present and uh, we are gathered for a budget workshop. So uh, Mrs. Uh, Carter, um, would you like to just take the floor and begin your uh, presentation or Dr. Kelly, did you have any you know, lead-in information or how did y'all want to go? Uh, I think uh, this is going to be George Annie's uh, show today and uh, right. she's put together, I think, a really good presentation. Uh, one thing I'd uh, ask your forbearance on uh, myself board, I was, I've already told this to Charles, but I also have an aspect meeting this morning that begins uh, at 1130 and, and uh, I've asked that if it's possible and, and everything is okay, that maybe at about noon, I may wink out of this one and join that one because uh, they've got some pretty important decisions to make down there uh, with all of us. Uh, but anyway, uh, Georgiani, uh, I'm pleased to take it away from here. Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the board, Dr. Kelly. I am going to share uh, my screen so we can follow through the presentation. One second. And let me know if you're able to see it. Looks good, George Annie. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so we've prepared our first budget workshop. Um, of course, we all are aware that there are many challenges that we're going to be facing this new this next year with a uh, COVID nineteen. Um, bear with me. So. Let's start by saying that this budget was uh, based on current formulas. Um, the way that, that the formulas are described by HB3, we're in the second year of the biennium. So we know that nothing, not much is changing for next year as, as far as funding is concerned. But this COVID situation is definitely going to impact um, the, the next year, um, the next biennium mainly. Um, as of now, one of the concerns uh, for next year is how to keep the students and teachers uh, safe while delivering the instruction in a setting that provides for social distancing. Um, there's been conversation about who comes to school, who doesn't, do we lower the student to teacher ratio in the classrooms to provide for social distancing? Um, will there be more um, instruction being delivered via uh, remote learning at the higher grades um, you know what is uh, the student capacity for bus for transporting students there's so many variables that we have to navigate through um, and we'll know more of course as the months progress um, there's some talk too about perhaps losing some students to homeschooling but the same um, on that same end we may also gain some students if the parents now feel like, okay, well, the district can provide them more learning and I'm gonna be homeschooling them here. So there might be a, a give and take. There could be also the opportunity or the, pro the possibility rather that um, some parents may, not, may no longer be able to afford private school and we may end up gaining some of those kids in, um, in, our, in our campuses. Um, so I'm going to take you through this presentation. It's uh, ever evolving. Every day there is something um, new that we know. And so of course it's going to be changing as the week's pro uh, progress up until budget adoption. And then of course once it's adopted we won't know how um, everything that is going on is going to in truly impact the uh, next fiscal year. Um, in regards to property values, you know, we'll, we'll hear that COVID had no impact on this current year's property values. So um, the value that we're given is the value that is going to be taken into consideration for next year. It may impact the future years, of course, because of the changes in the um, economy. Um, so, so far, there's no talk about um, special um, session. Uh, special legislative session, but uh, in January is when we'll have the session for the 2021-2023 school um, biennium, and that's when we'll know more about how this is all going to impact us in the future. 
All right. Uh, I'm going to start by discussing, of course, um, our funding elements. So let's start with some good news. Um, for this current fiscal year, uh, it looks like we might end up with a $3.5 million uh, surplus. There is always some savings of anywhere between a 1% and a 2% in payroll um, every year, as we know. And this year is a little bit different too because uh, there will be extra savings on some areas like utilities due to the school closures, um, some transportation expenses, some just general budget uh, items that campuses and departments may have had planned and no longer need. So we're hoping that there will be uh, more savings than that. Um, for the next budget workshop, uh, when we have it, I hope to have a better estimate of how we're gonna end the uh, school year uh, for the current, um, with the, the current school year. Uh, we're calculating also, working through the calculations for the fifth and sixth weeks of ADA. Um, TEA will be providing more guidance in the coming days as far as how we're gonna calculate the funding for this current year, since the kids are not here and we can't count 100% um, enrollment as um, average daily attendance. So we'll be working through that. Um, and as we know, you know, as, as, as much as there are some savings in payroll, um, as um, we're also experiencing some extra expenditures, such as with um, uh, premium pay for non-exempt employees currently. So some of the expenditures will wash off, but hopefully uh, we'll end up in a, in a very good positive um, surplus. Um, let's see. So for revenue projections, let me move to the next slide. We took a conservative approach, but also a realistic approach. Um, as we all know, one of the drivers of state funding is enrollment and average daily attendance. Uh, with enrollment, we are projecting a slight growth from uh, 21,760 students to 21,934. Um, ADA, hence, is also um, increasing. This is mainly due to the uh, pre-kindergarten kids that were expecting um, the number to increase. Um, however, they generate half ADA, so you won't see the same proportion increase um, on the um, ADA side. Um, as said before, we don't know how enrollment will be impacted. Will growth materialize, and if so, will students actually show up? or will we have lower attendance or enrollment rate, right? So there's a lot of variables. Um, there's unfortunately, well, fortunately, there is no precedent um, in history for anything of this magnitude um, that would allow us to have a clear estimate of enrollment or ADA, um, which of course, in conjunction with the property values, drive the state's um, uh, funding. And I'm gonna, you know, I, I did some calculations of what um, a percent, for, for example, uh, decrease in enrollment or ADA would, uh, would impact. For us, a 1% decrease in ADA is about 1.35 million. So it's pretty impactful. Um, but again, we don't know which way it's, it's, it's gonna go, right? Hey, Georgiani. Yes. I'm sorry. How, how much was that? You kind of broke up on my end. Oh, I'm sorry. 1.35 million. A 1.35. A 1% decrease. And Georgiani, do, we have, do we have an understanding of um, how ADA is currently being calculated within the COVID um, pandemic? Yes, um, TEA is about to release more clear guidance, but what basically what they're doing is that they're looking at the first through fourth uh, first six weeks, right? Then how, <clears throat> they're going to they're gonna go back to last year. How did we grow from the fourth to six weeks last year to the fifth and the sixth weeks last year? So whatever percent growth we're gonna be able to apply it to, um, to this current year. So it's gonna be based on some formulas. It's not super clear right now. I did the best that I could based on the information that I have, but I should be get, uh, we should all be getting uh, more clarity um, as far as how that's gonna impact. 
Any other questions with enrollment or ADA? Maybe okay. just a comment, uh, Georgiani and, and uh, others, that uh, with Hurricane Harvey and other uh, type things, the state's been very good. In fact, I would say we've even gotten some surprise money when they've done that kind of extrapolation of the past into what might have been had the event not occurred. So I'm, I'm very confident, and the commissioner has given out all kinds of language that indicates he's going to make us good on that. So, so far, our enrollment, as, a, as an added note, it has remained stable. So uh, we do have kids dropping out. We do have kids coming in, um, as as we normally do throughout um, the regular a regular year. Um, but so far, it's, it's been pretty stable, I would say. Okay, moving on to. Okay, I have some excellent news. Property values. Okay, um, so this uh, uh, growth that I calculated, that I estimated for for next year for the tax year 2020, was a 3.5 percent. As you can see, our increases throughout the years have been all over the place. So there's not really a a consistent standard. However, <clears throat> just right now when I logged in to the presentate to to give you the presentation, I had asked uh, Ms. Evans with the uh, Brasoria County Appraisal District if she could give me the 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 amount for the certified estimates. They haven't delivered it to us yet. We should be getting it this week, but she did tell me and that's why you probably saw me smiling and moving my calculating fingers. Um, she did tell me to expect about $9.2 billion. So those 8.6 that you see here, that 3.5% increase, that would mean it's 10.78% increase. Now, I'm hoping that's true um, until I have the paper on hand and of course until I get the real certified values in, in July. I can't fully count on it, but I would definitely be adjusting my, um, my revenues um, and the proposed tax rate um, if those numbers do hold true. And so I'll, um, I'll take you through that in the, in the next couple of slides. Um, again, as far as property values for tax year 2020, they're going to be unaffected by COVID-19, but the economy is certainly going to have an impact on property values, um, they pro perhaps the years uh, after. Um, again, um, pending to receive the certified estimates, and I will update those projections. And as you're aware, some, uh, for state funding purposes, we move to current year values. So for example, this current fiscal year, 1920, we had to do a budget amendment not too long ago because we received our, um, our property va uh, value study was done uh, late January. So that's what determines the current year funding. So what, um, what I do to be able to project next year's um, property values for state funding purposes is that I look at the history of um, the growth between um, um, the growth uh, on the certified values as compared to the growth on the T2 values from the, from the state. And so the, there I apply um, um, that, that margin to be able to calculate those um, state fund. Uh, that well, Georgiani, without getting technical, mm -hmm. uh, our board has shown an interest in advocacy at the state level. Uh, Although we do receive some benefit from what uh, Georgiani is explaining, the tax base growth, um, we would have received more of that benefit uh, if we were able to use past year values rather than current year values, if you remember that fight with the state. And so as we go into the legislature again next time, maybe a, a big advocacy point to return to prior years uh, so that we can reap that advantage. That's correct. Okay, so um, um, on to the next slide, and I'm gonna show you this one is in relation to the proposed uh, tax rate. And so what HP3 did is that they compressed the tax rate. As you know, this year, our, ta uh, our tax rate used to be a dollar and four cents. A dollar of it was what we call the compressed, what we call the tier 
to or golden pennies or enrichment pennies, however way you want to call them. Um, that to 93 cents uh, this year, and we kept our four golden pennies. That compressed rate is what the state youth funding, the golden pennies are on top of it. And so um, per HB3, um, their tax rates compress. We have, we have them compressed so that we only increase by about 2.5% prepare this calculation, which by the way, I do want to know where you have on paper numbers. The calculation for funding is accurate. I just transposed it um, on the slide so that you're, you're aware. If our property value grows, the state tells us that our compressed rate is going to be 0.9164. However, if we grow greater, now I'm hearing it's about 10.78%, our compressed rate lowers uh, much more. more so as you can see the rate that that I've just been given of nine we are looking at a compressed rate and I of um, 86 cents a huge relief to our taxpayers if that is the case Uh, um, the news to us in that the state must make up the difference as they compress the tax base. Doing in terms of golden pennies and opportunities there to both reduce our tax rate but also get more correct funding. so so that would be the great news it would be you know it would have a very positive effect on a taxpayer a much lower tax rate that is really the only way that our taxes are really going to drop um, as far as the funding like dr kelly says uh, we get the same basic allotment so if the state uh, whatever whatever we put in the state puts the difference so uh, that's the way it works with the compressed rate now on top of the compressed rate we have the golden pennies and for this year we are able to increase our golden pennies from four cents to five cents and we really have to take uh, a, a advantage of this opportunity we don't know how the legislature is going to change for the next year we did look into uh, the possibility of doing a TRE, but the way that our proposed budget is looking, we felt like that one penny would uh, suffice, at least for this year, while uh, the overall tax rate would still decrease um, uh, for our taxpayers. So uh, our proposed INS rate, you're gonna see that, that it remains the, the same. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So, uh, as I, as I stipulated here, at a 3.5%, at a the tax rate was gonna be $1.3920. I really do have to look at, into those formulas and recalculate it again. But hopefully if, if our property values are growing, as uh, I've been told that they're growing, that tax rate is gonna be significantly lower. So any other questions here? I see one from Ms. Carbone. Mrs. Carbone? Yes, ma'am. I um, am wondering, is there limitations on the golden pennies piece? I mean, can we um, go above the five cents without having to do a TRE or is the five cents a limitation? The five cents is the limitation. They're allowing us one cent without doing a TRE and the way it works is that it, it requires unanimous uh, board approval um, to be able to get those that fifth golden penny. Mm -hmm. If we were to do a TRE um, that would allow us to, you know, we, we could go up to 17 cents with a TRE only, we would have to do an efficiency audit. We would have to be starting the efficiency audit sometime next month in order to meet the timelines. Um, 
But right now, the way that we've built this budget, we feel that uh, just with that one golden penny, we're able to um, to meet our needs uh, while not putting uh, a strain in the taxpayers. And then the difference between the 3.5 and the percent increase expected in property values and the 10.7 maybe coming from, you get it in writing, is an educated guess based on prior knowledge of what our property value growth was compared to actuals of what our property growth was, correct? Right. I, typically when I get the certified estimates, I don't go by that number. I lower it because I want to make sure that we are conservative in our projections. Um, so I would definitely think of lowering it. Um, as far as when it comes to presenting the budget to you in June that we have to advertise and publish the rate, I would, I would publish the highest rate. We won't know truly what the rate is until the beginning of August when TEA tells us this is your compress rate. And from there we'll all we'll add the golden pennies and then take it to you for um, for adoption. Okay. Uh, now Mrs. Decker and then followed by Mr. Barry. Rebecca, would you start your comments over? You were mute. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> um, we've been talking about the TRE for at least the last couple of years. And now um, with you saying we're going to be okay this year, but then you also had stated that um, in the next couple of years are, are, you know, are so, it's kind of sketchy looking, right? So is that something that we're going to end up having to do next year? And should we start thinking about the, the TRE for the following biennium as opposed to you know this next school year? Yes, for this next school year we can we can certainly say that we're we can be clear of the TRE so we don't have to consider it for this school year. Uh, for next biennium it's very likely that funding is going to be greatly affected and we may need to look at the TRE. Okay. We're pretty likely going to be looking at the TRE but we won't know that until the legislature uh, and until the legislative session starts and they start the conversations and we know more about how all this is affecting the state's budget. Thank you. Now the uh, comptroller, uh, one of the things he said was uh, anticipating a 20% cut for basically state services. Uh, whether that hits education or I wouldn't imagine it would hit 20%, but it will hit very high. And it, you know, of course the other major concern in the state budget is human and health services. There's the other huge uh, bite of the state's budget. And of course, those needs will be greater than ever with uh, COVID-19. So we're very safe uh, for the coming year. Uh, the question is beyond the coming year, what do things look like knowing that the legislature will come in with a mantra to cut, cut, cut. Um, we are in a strong position because of our fund balance and can absorb a blow that other school districts can't. But that's maybe the interplay as we build our budget even for this next year. It's not so much um, how we'll be this year, but also being careful about what we do so that uh, we're not in a, uh, we've not dug a, a deep hole that, uh, that would hurt us in the following two years. Um, and I think we've that's what we're proposing to you. So, yeah. Dr. Kelly, uh, one other question, uh, Charles. Um, I, you know, I've been reading too that the the governor um, currently is asking his departments within the state to actually start doing cuts that could actually affect us in this next school year. Um, I haven't heard that. So. Well, I, I don't, I mean, I know that, I don't know if he's, he's just, that, that he's given that authority that he can do, I mean, because of the, the, I guess it's because of the emergency clause or whatever. Um, I didn't know if you've heard any information from uh, Commissioner Marath, whether or not he's been asked to, to cut his budget by 20% or anything like that. No, okay. not, we've not heard anything so far on that. That's good. Um, you know, I, I think the governor has very limited authority there. I think that if he was to uh, require cuts to uh, state passed bills like House Bill 3 and the rest of them, 
he would have to call a special session and have the legislature agree with him on it. That's what I had thought too. So, you know, I was a little bit, so I thought I'd come to the source and see what you, what you had actually heard or if George Annie had heard anything too. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm signed up to a bunch of newsletters from everyone and not, not yet, not so far. You haven't heard that yet. Okay, Hopefully good. Not. good. Good. Then it was just a rumor and I'm just glad that that's been dispelled here. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so moving on to the projected. Mrs. Uh, Carter, huh? Mr. Carter, let me go back and get a uh, question from uh, Mr. Barry. Go ahead, Mr. Barry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. The uh, so we were talking about we were talking about the increased uh, um, the increased property values, which in turn is going to reduce our compressed tax rate. In in turn, reducing our our tax liability to to all the property uh, owners in in our district. Um, have you done any kind of predictive analysis on you know if that's truly the case and that number is is right? Um, given you know maybe splitting the difference and paying off additional uh, bond. Uh, uh, additional bonds like you were talking about you know further on into the uh, presentation well I just got the number right now right but as far as that okay. is concerned with the funding we don't get extra funding uh, it just you know if if the local portion goes down the state portion goes up so, yeah, so it's, a, it's a wash right it's a wash right so it, it really doesn't affect us uh, overall it does have a positive impact on our taxpayers it does have a positive impact, but I'm I'm thinking more along the lines of not necessarily, you know, what would it take to maybe split the difference, so to speak, in between the actual resulting compressed rate to the, um, you know, to the current tax rate. So splitting the difference between those two what would that take? What, what would we have to do to be able to do that? And I'm just looking into the future, you know, with $800 million in debt. I'm oh, you're trying to about figure out if it's even worthwhile. Okay, so that debt service rate is completely separate. That one is not subject to the compression. So the debt service rate, we, it has to be set at an amount that is going to cover our, um, our debt service. For, for the year and then have enough fund balance to be able to maintain our current ratings. We, uh, we're gonna touch base on that a little bit later on. There are some refunding, bond refunding opportunities that are coming up. The earliest ones are in um, January. And to be able to take advantage of that, we have to start the process in June. And so June of this year. So there, there will be some um, um, discussion about that, but that's uh, separate. Jeff, is your question more about on the um, M and O side splitting the difference and potentially going for a TRE now that there's a a, a decrease in the overall rate? Well, I mean that could be that could be a, one of the solutions um, because we can move money from M and O to INS, but just not the, the other way. We, we can't. So. We can't raise the M and O rate for the purpose of paying debt. That was something. Well, if we if we did the TRE, we could. That was something. We would have we would have those of that ability. I'll need to research a little bit more, but I believe that as part of HB three, um, they're prohibiting us from doing that. Um, but I'll research more and definitely bring it to the next budget work work session. But I guess the other side of that in the the fact that we're seeing such a drop to taxpayers if we see the difference and went for a TRE now versus them seeing a huge drop and then us going back and asking for more money later. Right now we can still, I mean, right. we're, they would right. still be seeing a drop and yet we would be accumulating $2.5 million for every TRE penny we ask for above the five cents is there any benefit and advantage to doing that now versus waiting for that huge drop and then asking for it later? Definitely. That's right. That's, uh, I mean, you're a hundred percent correct on that. And, you know, we can definitely talk about that. Um, Dr. Kelly, any input? I can't hear you. Sorry. 
Yeah, that's it. what uh, Jeff and Crystal there are saying is uh, legit in that, you know, from a political point of view, if the overall tax rate is low, that's the optimum time right. to uh, ask the people for a portion of that to go up. Um, as as you, I think you get later in the presentation, you can talk about refinancing options, which affect the total number of pennies we need. Brian S. that can contribute to that. Uh, but I, right now, the other concern I bring up is purely political, and that is it's going to be hard enough for board elections in November in the sense that uh, our, we're told that our particular race is at the very bottom of the ballot. And so relying on a TRE during a presidential election is iffy. Um, may not be true for May of May of 2021, but um, the problem there is that if the legislature comes and changes the system again and doesn't give you those advantages, it, it'll be hard for us to know right there in January or February whether we would benefit or whether they're once again changing it or no longer compressing tax rates or something like that. But I agree with Crystal 100%. This has been my mantra for many years. The, the taxpayer appreciates the decrease but doesn't remember it when you go and you say, well, now we got to go up another couple of pennies in a future year, they don't, they don't remember that you've right. already done them that favor. And so it's nice when you can do both at the same time and come out with a lower rate. But if the advantage to doing it now is there wouldn't be, um, even if the TRE didn't pass for some reason, which historically our community is very supportive of supporting educational needs, I would think especially in light of COVID and the extra needs coming from that, um, but even if it didn't pass, we would not be hurting per se. Um, it would still be like tight and we'd be watching our pennies, but we wouldn't, it would not hurt us as if we were waiting two years down the road and the TRE is not passed, then we're in a pickle. Well, that's good thinking. I mean, I hadn't really gone down that road very far, but that's not bad thinking really. I had been an advocate of exploring a TRE and had been tracking the whole thing with the Legislative Budget Board uh, producing their, you know, performance, uh, performance audit measures or steps or, and was really excited about pushing that. And but for me, one of the other issues is that, you know, now you're talking about a, a tax increase and who knows what the, the broader economy is going to look like. Right. We've got the tax values right which is a huge increase right that looks great but i mean as far as just you know the the cash flow the, the economy of the individual taxpayers you know that's we got to take that into account and then for me a tax rate a tre or an increase in the tax rate kind of has to be connected to a vision for what we want to do with the district and for me those things have been you know always we want to talk about compensation and being able to be uh, competitive with um with you know surrounding districts and you know and and things of that nature and also we've talked about block scheduling and we've talked about uh the the issue there is that you know well number one you got space for a lot of extra teachers and then you also talk about uh you just got a lot of extra teachers and i think the number that dr camp came up with was, was almost three million dollar uh additional on salaries right and then we talk about other stuff that we have like school start times which we identified what the constraints were there i mean the tre can't completely fix that but i mean just building that into our thinking as to why we would want to increase the tax rate i think is extremely important well um, and that's the only way to generate additional revenue for us right 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 but it, but I, but i mean my my message to the community would be that we're not trying to generate additional income to the district just to generate income right. into the district. There's a vision tied to it, right? Your schools are going to be what we think or is better uh, because we're going to have these additional funds that we're going to do, you know, whatever these things are. Lower uh, student teacher ratio. Right. Lower student yeah, exactly. Right. So it all to me has to be tied to a vision, you know. So that that's just my thought and it may there's a lot of different things to uh consider right here you know because of the economic situation that we're in um 
you know, that maybe we do, maybe we don't, but I, I think it's something we can continue to discuss. Well, you know, well, you know, the thing about it is too, Charles, is mm -hmm. is we also need to understand our eight hundred million dollar debt. So we need to always keep in mind, in the back of our mind, we can't do any of those things you talked about unless we control our expenses and control our budget. Mm -hmm. And then we have the wherewithal and the freedom to go and do all those those great things you were just talking about but it starts at our budget and you know the TRE is not going to be a tax increase or a tax burden per se to where we are today it's going to be a you know at best you know it's still going to be potentially a decrease just maybe not as much of a decrease if if we're thinking about doing it you know my question earlier so uh, so I I agree have, there needs to be a vision, but. Yeah, I mean, if we could have a quick conversation about debt. Um, Mrs. Carter, does, do school districts pay debt off early? And my understanding is that it's, it's just not that kind of, you know, th that's not the way it works. <laughs> but right. yeah, um, if we're talking about managing debt and because, you know, yeah, I'll just leave it there and, and ask you that question. No, typically we don't pay it off early. Um, the, what we're presenting to you, uh, it's some bonds that are actually callable already. Mm -hmm. We can call them already. Um, I will have John Roebuck. Um, I, I don't think he's able to join us today. I had invited him, but he had already uh, another scheduled meeting. But I will have them at the next uh, work session. That way he can provide some insight some more insight in regards to the bond side. So you made a comment, Georgiani, about you typically don't pay them off early. And my, my question to you is why? Well, What's the technical reason why you would not want to do that? No. And I'm not saying be a hundred, I'm not looking at being debt free per se, because we're always going to have some sort of debt, but man, Reducing our, if you look at our, if you look at our, uh, our debt service out to 2035, you know, it goes, you know, from 38 million to, you know, 15, 18 million. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty substantial amount where we would have, we would, we would have a lot of taxable flexibility for, for the property owners of Paraline ISD. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, normally, why would you not want to pay off debt? Charles, I mean, uh, Jeff, normally, uh, and uh, bonds that are callable can be paid off early and refinanced. Um, there are restrictions on some bonds in terms of paying them off early. And I think that's been my experience. Now, John Roebuck, he can give us a lot more guidance as to the kinds of bo bonds we have now. We have bonds going back to the 90s, and some may have uh, abilities to do things and others may not. But I. I'd have to defer. Right. To yeah, right. I, I completely understand that process. That's I'm not to, not the question. Yeah, let me <laughs> that's, that's, that's not the question. More. And um, and I'll at the next budget workshop we'll go further into that. May I make another note here? I think whenever the refinancing happens, we're going to be holding that debt at such an inexpensive rate that the value of the money that we would have to spend and the would be greater than because of the rate being so low on the debt holdings that it seems like we would have a greater benefit in the spending capability of that money than the cost of what it hold what it costs to hold that debt. I that's guess. why you refinance. Yes, I'm gonna have I mean, to that's, I'm gonna that's have the to reason. More. Okay. I, I I appreciate this conversation. Let's 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 give the floor back to Mrs. Carter to move that back. But what I, what I'm thinking is that we still have to understand, and let me know if I'm off base here, we still have to understand that the, the two sides of the tax rate are not interchangeable. No. Right, so you know, I cannot manage my m &O to generate extra dollars to pay off debt, right? And I cannot manage my INS to generate extra dollars to pay off debt because that has to be set at what it has to be set at, am I correct? Right. Yes, and the legislature just strengthened that in the last session okay. to keep people from doing that. Okay. Okay. Well, 
Okay, great. Well, we can we can uh, continue to clarify that. Uh, Mrs. Carter, we'll hand the floor back to you. Thank you. I took some notes. So I'll take a I'll make a one comment is is that the reason why we're able to reduce and refinance is because we do have more money on the tax base side, which ultimately becomes part of the M and O side. So okay. that's, that's not quite true. What's not quite true? We can manage our M and O side, given a surplus on our M and O side to move money over to potentially pay off and or refinance bond obligations as they come avail as they come available. It, in the past, the last couple of years, it, interest rates were too high. It didn't make any sense. But now, as interest rates are going down, that's why we're now we're now we're talking about refinancing those bond obligations. And if we would have had money on the M and O side today, we would we would be able to put more money down on the re refinancing of the bond obligations. So that's my point. That's all I'm saying. I'll I'll do a little bit more research. There was definitely some changes with HB three, but let me do my research. Um, okay. I wasn't prepared to discuss the, that, but I will. No worries. No worries. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Thanks, Jordan. Sure. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the projected revenue changes from where we're at, from where we're at right now, on the local side, uh, property tax collections at the 3.5 percent property value that I calculated were uh, 2.6 million. Investments, we all know that interest rates have dropped significantly, so I'm expecting at least an $800,000 uh, drop in 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 interest earnings. Um, in the state side, um, because property values are going up um, and because ADA, we're not growing significantly really is because of the ADA, uh, we're only expecting about a $655,000 increase in state funding. Um, and that is inclusive of the extra penny, the fifth golden penny, these calculations, okay, just to clarify. Um, on the federal side, we're still calculating uh, this year's SHARs, and once we finish, we'll know a better um, accurate amount, but we're expecting uh, no change on the, on the federal revenues for next year. So overall, our total revenue increase is about $2.7 um, million. Um, when you compare it to where we're at right now, to, next, uh, to what we're budgeting for next year. Okay, um, let's discuss a little bit deeper the state and local funding. This is about 87% of our revenues are driven by the formula, uh, by, by the state funding formulas. So our local property values at, uh, at, at, at the established rate are 78.7 million. Uh, out of that, tier one is 76.5 million and tier two, which is your golden pennies, is 8.6 million for a total of 163.7 million. That golden penny that is included in that amount, it's about 2.5 million, 833,000 from the local property tax base and 1.7 million from the state uh, side. Any questions with uh, revenues? I'm gonna move on to appropriations. No? Thank you. Okay, so uh, budget priorities. Of course, to be able to develop the budget, we looked at our, at our goals. One of the things that we're doing this next year is establishing full day pre-kindergarten program. So of course, last month, we already brought to you some additional positions uh, for teachers for moving, the, moving us to a full day pre-K program. We are, uh, another budget priority is to provide a competitive employment compensation package and increase um, the support towards the employee medical premiums. We also wanna make sure that we provide funding to support our world-class goal initiatives. Last year, we developed a brand new uh, set of uh, goals. And so we're trying to uh, accommodate um, some expenditures that are needed to be able to accomplish those goals. And of course, provide funding to support HB3 mandates.
So last month, you approved 10, 10 and a half new, pos new positions for a full day pre-K and four and a half teacher positions to maintain the high level of service for English language learners and for special needs students. And that amount is about $971,000. That was a budget impact that is included in, the, in this proposed uh, budget that you're gonna be seeing here today. We are proposing um, a general pay increase of 4%. And uh, even though uh, you, you guys may, may already be having uh, conversations with other districts or maybe hearing of what other districts are doing, last year, as we all are aware, uh, we didn't go too high uh, when other districts went very high. Uh, unfortunately, we ended up at not the best um, um, market, you know. Um, so this year we're proposing a 4% general pay increase, which would uh, bring um, the starting pay from 56,000 to 58,100. Uh, it impacts the teachers and li librarians by 3.5 million. It includes some targeted adjustments for years of services to bring, to bring us a little bit closer to market. Um, this year we were uh, for our 15 plus and 20 plus year of service um, we were at 94 percent of market so doing this brings us to about 98 percent this four percent increase is equivalent to 2,500 so even though it doesn't bring us to 100 percent for years of uh, uh, 15 plus it starts bringing us a little bit closer and so um, the offset of not doing this is that next, the next year would be even further behind and even harder to catch up. So this is, um, this is a great uh, opportunity to, to catch up with the rest of the districts. On the professional support for, uh, for our professional staff, counselors, nurses, special programs, uh, that 4% is, is equivalent to 1.2 million. And for our prior professionals is 1 million. So the total 4% increase is equivalent to 5.7 million, and that includes, again, some targeted adjustments for years of service. Anything that you, anybody wants to add there? I see a hand up, but I don't hear anything. Uh, Ms. Carter. Yes. Can you, or maybe um, Mr. Moody can, can you break down what, I know that we have the 4%, but then what is the actual uh, amount of the targeted adjustments taken out of that? Uh, the amount of the targeted adjustments for teachers, I think George Annie would have that. It's about two hundred fifty thousand. Yes, okay. it's about two hundred fifty thousand, and it um, it mainly affects years of service eight through sixteen. I want to say, I and then again at the twenty four plus years. Okay, Rebecca, it would have impact to some degree above the four percent about seven hundred teachers out of our thirteen hundred teachers. 776. Okay. Wow, okay. And, and if I could add to that real quick, Georgina, if you don't mind, um, on the 4%, uh, I know that I've talked to you guys before about where we came in when the dust settled. So just to kind of repeat that, the TASB information came back in and, um, and looking at it, when we look back at last year, um, our raise was actually out of the 19 districts that I compare our district to, which are districts that are right around us that we look at, um, our raise came in 19th. And so the average uh, raise last year, or the, me uh, the median was 4.5. In the 75th percentile, that raise was about 6%. And that's important, that 75th percentile is important because part of our strategic plan and our goal within finances was to look at, when we sat in that uh, group, and I'm not sure which board members, if any of you were in there, but we had about 40 people in there from the community and the district. Uh, we, we talked about being competitive with our, with our compensation plan, both benefits and salary. And so we, we had discussion in HR about what is competitive in our world. And so with, with our district being uh, one of the best out there, in my opinion, uh, and I think all of our opinions, and what we expect out of our district, um, we put the 75th percentile on that, the, the top quartile, meaning that when we start looking at year to year, uh, comparing where we are, we we don't want to compare just to the market. We want to compare to where does this.
employee base. Um, the four percent does give us a chance in a, and I think in a market this year where you'll see districts that are not as prone to jump out there and do big races. Many of them did up to nine percent, six percent, seven percent. I don't see that happening this year. So we get a chance to catch back up a little bit. So when Georgiani references to the market, the market, we're, we're comparing that jump right now, so you know, to a market that hasn't moved yet. It's the market that we see right now. The market will move again. So whatever gain we make uh, will be negated just a bit by when the market moves again. Um, the, the hope is, is that if we can hit the 4% and potentially uh, with some equity adjustments to teachers, some teachers will even hit as high as 5% that will make a difference there on the benchmark years. Um, also want to add to that, <clears throat> that I think is important, at the 15 year and the 20 year benchmark years, at the 15 year on the ranking of our district to the 19 districts, we're 17th, I believe. And on the 20th year and above, we're 20th. And so when I, when I speak about these districts, I want you to know they're LaPorte, Houston, um, Stafford Municipal, so we've got, We've got some movement that we need to make if, if that can happen. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bakken, you raised your hand. You had a question? Sorry, Mrs. Carter. Sure. Um, so for, for clarification purposes on the wellness counselors, um, we're adding two for the remainder junior high. So everybody will have one per is that correct oh we're not there yet um oh did i bump ahead i'm sorry yes <laughs> oh okay okay well okay then I, i'll move to my next question i apologize um when maybe uh, is dr kelly is there any talk of you know with the trs healthcare and everything uh we, we had been working on trying to help our employees with the situation out in el paso and what they were trying to do. Is there any, is there any headway on that? Well, uh, first of all, let me uh, issue an apology. I am right now participating in two Zoom meetings simultaneously. Uh, so I'm kind of in and out, may miss some of this conversation. Uh, but in terms of health insurance, as David may explain at a point in this uh, deal, we're going to add the uh, $25 per month as, as we talked about last year and slowly incrementing on that. In terms of the El Paso idea, uh, I've heard a lot of skepticism lately, and that's uh, that's as much as I know right now. David, you may know. Yeah, I, can, I can just add in real quick, Dr. Kelly. Um, I think that's cool a little bit. Uh, the districts around, there were quite a few summits. Uh, you know, the TRS did a regional um, tour, if you will, across the state of Texas to listen to local districts. And I think they went back and uh, there were some changes to that. I haven't, I'm not sure if you had a chance to look at some of the changes to the benefits this year, but I'm excited that they've offered a new plan. It's called a primary plan. Um, you know, while it still has expense to it, it is a, it is a, uh, a growth opportunity for some of our employees. And I think George Annie might get into that a little bit about cost savings. But if you, for example, if you were on the current select plan right now, and you were to decide to go to the primary plan because they're very similar, um, you have the ability to save quite a bit of money depending on where you are. So when you couple the potential savings on our plans this year that, that are offered by TRS, right, with the, the idea that the board would add another $25 of contribution, remember we, uh, what I asked you guys last year and I felt like you were in agreement and I hope that you still will be is that we take the next three years to contribute $25 each year. And so I think that Georgiani has placed that in the budget for your approval as well. But if we can get ourselves to a point where we're at $300 in contribution, plus the enhancements here uh, from the state level, I feel like uh, most of our employees, and Georgiani can hit on this too, most of our employees outside of a few that are on active care too right now, and there's, there's about 50 on that, will have the opportunity to save money on benefits this year. George, Andy, do you want to weigh in on that? Yes, well, that was actually my next slide. Um, so if I can go through the presentation really quick, and I think it's okay, going to sorry. I think it's gonna answer a lot of questions, Mr. Barkin. I think you're going to be very pleased with this. Last year, we um, well, actually this current year, we increased it from uh, 225 to 250, our district contribution. Uh, we're, we are proposing to increase it, and I built it into this proposed budget. 
from 250 to 275, so adding another $25. Here you see the new plans. Um, TRS has talked to all the districts. They, they went on tour basically for the last year talking to all of the districts, we were in participation as well, uh, because they were fearing that a lot of us were gonna jump out uh, and do something similar to what uh, El Paso is doing, right? And so they did go ahead and contract now with Blue Cross Blue Shield. So they moved it from Aetna to Blue Cross Blue Shield. They added an additional plan, as well as uh, reduced the premiums and significantly, well, um, to some extent also reduce the deductibles. Um, so they enhance the plans overall. I included a lot more information on the package that I sent to you um, last Friday. You'll see uh, some highlights of the plans and whatnot. But for us, if you look at this slide, um, on the green side is where we're currently contributing $250. So with the current contribution, and the new plan, um, an employee can, can, uh, can uh, pay if they're on an employee only plan, about $136. Um, and if they're an employee and family, uh, about $1,051, that would be the lowest on the new primary plan. It's very similar to the primary plus, which is formerly the select plan. Um, a little bit higher de uh, deductibles, but uh, very similar overall. And so you'll see here on the bottom side, that is the monthly savings to the employee. The green one is, again, if we don't change our contribution at all, uh, that's what the employee will be seeing in savings on a monthly basis. On the blue one is if we add those $25 that we're proposing uh, to have a district contribution of $275, that's the monthly amount that the employee will see in savings. The first one I have it with a red asterisk, the primary, the, it's a new plan. Uh, those savings are if I am currently in the select plan and I decide to move to the new primary plan instead of staying on that select plan, which is now called primary plus, those would be the savings that you would have. So on the information that I gave to you um, on your packet, which is looks like this, um, you can see that an employee can save on, a, on an annual basis if they're employee only uh, from $2,340 to if they're employee and family, $5,304. So David can weigh in a little bit more on this, but I think there's gonna be a very good uh, communication and education for our employees so they can uh, be more savvy when they go ahead and choose uh, yeah. their plan for next year. Yeah, one of the things I would point out real quick as you're looking at Georgiani's information is that high deductible, that second one there, that about a thousand of our 1400 employees live on that plan that's what they select the active care two that you're looking at which is very costly about 50 to 55 live on that plan so in our department we started talking about this past uh, week on how do we how do we begin to educate especially since we have a new primary plan we want to educate and so we'll have a series probably rolls out within a week um, to two weeks where we educate our employees on each plan the best we can and give them an opportunity Especially, we might even target, um, I've talked about with Sunday and uh, my benefit specialist to target the active care two employees because there's a chance there. Um, I hope you don't mind, Dr. Kelly, if I point you out. Dr. Kelly used to be on the active care two plan family. And he sat down and, and made the transition to that high deductible plan. And at the time that he did that, that's a big change because of the benefits that he was used to. But you can definitely see the cost difference there of jumping or dropping down to the high deductible plan. And what I think uh, uh, Dr. Kelly did to make himself feel a little bit better about dropping down is he opened up an HSA account. And um, so we've got to you know, do, do some things like that. We educate our employees that there's coverage here um, and there's opportunity to save money here. At the same time, if the district can continue contributing, we have maybe potentially one of our better years in the experience that we've had in a long time. That's, that's my thought. Hey, uh, Mr. Moody. Yes. Uh, follow back up on that. You gave some percentages of employees for, you said yeah. how many of them were on the I think I would say how many of our employees are on our actual insurance is probably uh -huh. around 60% is what okay. I would say. 
Um, it's usually right around that number. And uh, going off of the numbers that Georgiani provided, which I think are, are fairly accurate, uh, our, our high deductible plan is 1,046. The select primary plan, or the so select, which will end up being that primary, plus 288, which will now have the option that 288 employees, when we start talking to them about you know, the, high de the primary new and the primary plus closely align in a lot of areas outside of like George Andy said, the deductible is different on that primary new. It's, it's a little higher and there's a copay to it. But we can look at that 288 uh, group of employees and start trying to educate them on, would you be interested in the primary? Yeah. And if so, they stand to make, if they're sitting on, for example, right now on that select plan, we have 10, not that many, but 10 that are on the family, employee and family plan. If they were to find a way to jump down or drop down to that primary new family plan, they save a lot of money on top of whatever raise we can give and whatever contribution yeah. we can provide. So there's, there's a chance here. We just need to educate along the way. Yeah. Uh, so um, two questions and I'm always on top of this TRS healthcare cause I've been trying to get yeah. it through for everybody around the state for the most part. But when, when our employees, you don't have to go into detail too much, but when our employees look at the improvements uh, to the TRS healthcare, are they going to look at it and go, wow, that's a, you know, uh, drastic improvement or, cause I'm, I'm not trying to get into the weeds and of all the details because we're always fighting, you know, South of us, uh, a different district that is on their own. And they, I hear that constantly about their healthcare and how much money and how great their healthcare is. So I just want to know, comparison is this moving bigger in the right direction or just slightly in the right direction well i think you know there's a lot of that lance that i would have to say and it's a hard answer one i would say to that question is um no not all employees are going to say i want to jump into this because for the most part i'm sure mr burger could test attest to that that a lot of our employees our lowest paid employees are not taking this insurance in general okay. and so you you're missing out on quite a few already off the top i haven't done that uh analysis in a while but i know that that's significant um, separate from that, when you analyze to Alvin first, uh, Alvin is, you know, uh, they're bleeding a little bit. We're hearing some, some chatter from Alvin ISD about their plan and, uh, and they are having to make adjustments. Employees are having to take on more costs. And I think that you'll see that continue the more that Alvin grows. And I know that they're a neighbor and competitor to us. And so that's important, but I do see their trend moving in a different way. I think they'll hold on to it as long as they can, because it is, um, it's, it's critical to them. It's crucial to their uh, recruitment. Um, I think that the primary plan is a, a beginning step, though, from, from a state level and from employees being able to look at something and, and continue to shrink the cost that they're paying. Uh, the Active 2, the Active Care 2, is a plan that's it's going out. There's no one can even jump into that plan anymore. So the cost of that um, once someone gets out of it, they're not going to be allowed to get back in it. So the state's looking and moving more in a direction of those that those three plans, the first ones you see there, the primary, the high deductible, and the primary plus. Okay, if that's good. As long as y'all feel like they're moving in that direction. My last question, and I've always wondered this, I don't know how many employees we have, but a married couple that both work in the district, I, I've never ever seen anything where they get a break or anything. Is that something that... TRS is looking at, or do we give a, some sort of break on that, or what? I don't, Georgini, do you have the answer on that one? Uh, I, they do get a pooled, what they call the pooled rate. Yeah. So if, for instance, we contribute to 75, let's say that they, they're only employee and spouse, and they're in the primary new plan of 814, um, the one that's $814 with the cost they'll see an extra deduction of 275. So it's what they call a pooled plan. Um, so you get the deduction from both um, spouses, the state contribution and the local contribution. All right, thank you. Okay, any other questions with? Uh... Yes, ma'am, uh, from Mr. Berry, then Mrs. Decker. Hey, hey, Mr. Moody. Hey, Jeff. Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Quick question for you. Um, I, I actually personally like the, uh, the HD plan as well. Um, and I know that we, you said we had a thousand people on that plan. Yeah. But have we considered, have we considered say doing a 
$500 contribution to an HSA for them, for those on that plan. And annually, uh, that, that adds up to about $700,000 in cost to the ones that need it. Um, or, or, I mean, across the board, if we did all 1,400. Yeah. But I think that's a PPO plan versus an HMO plan that the other two are. I think that's a stronger plan. And they can use that money in the HSA to for deductibles and copays and whatever. So I can uh, kind of, we, yes, we've kicked that around. I've talked to Dr. Kelly. I think we talked uh, Dr. Kelly even last year about it. And so what you run into mm-hmm. with it, Jeff, is in, in our district, um, every dollar matters. And so in my mind, we try to be as equitable with that dollar as we can. And so when we start pushing in $500, if we did that, um, you you are not giving that money to every other employee. And so at some point, you know, that's decision. Are we going to go heavy on our benefits and leave 40% of our employees off of that? Or do we go in and potentially give them some money uh, on an FSA account, for example? So we've talked about, can we do that? Um, is it legal to do that? I think that George and Annie um, have weighed in at some point. I don't think the, for example, the, the active care too, some of these plans don't even uh, allow for HSA. Uh, in fact, I think that- Right, it's only the one. Only right? the high deductible allows for an HSA. And so, yeah, you you, t- you right. have a thousand, but you miss out on 400 others unless you're going to do something with an FSA and um, another 40% of your employee base. So what we end up doing is um, spending our money on a general pay increase to make that as equitable and fair as possible. That's been our history. Well, we also need to weigh the fact that we're trying to, we're trying to attract and retain good solid teachers and employees too. Yeah. I mean, so if, if that is truly an Achilles heel for us with Alvin providing um, or other districts providing stronger benefits than we are, I think we need to really take a good, strong, hard look at it. And, you know, if we have to spend a little bit more money on benefits than we have to, I mean, I'm looking at the four plans and, you know, you've got, you've got of the, of the ones that the majority of the folks are on that the new people can even join those three, two of them are HMOs. So they have to have physician referrals. So, you know, and so Jeff, what I would say to all that is, um, I, I agree with you and I would be, I would be incredibly happy if the board was able to, and George Annie had, uh, the, the ability to say, we have the money available for this. I think our first, uh, you know, we have all these talks and, and through the years, I listen to all of them. And then we sit here and in the end, our first goal should be in my mind to contribute more. Um, because when we line up against other districts, that's where it's, you show that we're, we, we haven't contributed as much. And so even if this year, you know, last year, I think Sean kind of kicked it around at the last board meeting of, you know, should we do 50 rather than 25? And so if money is available and Dr. Kelly approves that and we're able to jump out there and do $50 contribution, that gets you closer to 900000 And I think $300 contribution puts you in a really good spot for our employee base. It's very competitive. That's the first thing I do. Unfortunately, we have two issues at play, which one of them I shared earlier is the actual compensation, the salary piece. So uh, from, a, from a recruiting point of view, I've taken the approach of let's try to get the, the raise uh, in, in a good place because we didn't come in a good, when the dust settled, we didn't come in a good spot last year. I think that's imperative. And then continue to kind of baby step into putting more uh, into our insurance, into our benefits over the next three years. But if the board finds the available funds to put fifty dollars in this year, I think that's even a, a bigger win. I would like. I was per, last last comment. I would just like to see that employee only contribution be under a hundred dollars. That would be awesome. Uh, hey, well, that was that's all I'm thinking. Uh, yeah. well, um, for Dr. Kerr, you said under hundred dollars. Oops. I believe what he meant what he meant is that he would like to see this amount that you see here uh, the employee only at a uh, hundred dollars or, or less so contribute a little bit more to make it a hundred dollars or less I think that's why right now with a 275 contribution I think George Annie on the uh, mm-hmm. HD it's a to the employee is hundred and twenty two dollars mm-hmm. yes 
Okay, Lance, uh, I've got you there, but Rebecca had her hand up. Rebecca, can we go ahead and uh, you had a question? Lance, we'll get to you right after Rebecca. Actually, Jeff asked it, so I'm good. Okay, okay. Mr. Bakken? Yes, um, how do we, um, I don't know how, how this looks, but you made a statement earlier about uh, Larry Berger's, uh, uh, some of his employees and things like that. Um, how do we, and maybe Jeff was going that direction, how do we get them to, you know, I, it pains me to feel that, you know, people who don't choose our insurance, at least they're maybe choosing their spouse's insurance, right? And so, you know, I would want everybody to at least have the opportunity to get our insurance because it's affordable um, and it's going to help them and their family. How do we, you know, get to a point where we try and get everybody at least you know, wanting our insurance. And I know it's a cost thing, Mr. Moody and Dr. Kelly, but, you know, does that make sense what I'm asking? It does, but I think to do that, and, and Dr. Kelly could weigh in here again, we've had this same conversation probably two years ago about what can we do, but you get into a legal position where it becomes a, what, what is considered a competitive plan. And so we've talked about um, how can we piece together something that allows for something uh, for that employee base and um, it, it becomes that we need to go out and get us up on a plan. That's probably one of the only ways we can do that, and it is expensive. Uh, I think Georgiani's total budget for what we contribute right now is $4.7 I don't know what that's going to cost the district to get out to a self-funded plan, but I continue to say that it's going to cost you probably at least three more million, at least that much, to come up with in our budget to provide that kind of service that your uh, support you're wanting, uh, Lance. Now there's other things that we possibly could do um, where we could look at some of our sup supplemental insurance and, and see if uh, we want to take on some of that for that employee base and we want to pay yeah. for more for say vision or dental. Uh, those are things we can always look at. So, the, you know, inside of our own employees, do we know the exact numbers, I'm sure we do, I guess, how many, and the reasons why they don't choose our insurance or um, have we done a survey? I, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm reaching no, no, data on that. Lance, I haven't done that, but that's something that we can do pretty quickly. Um, I would think for the most part on the lowest paid employees, um, uh, Larry, I'd hate to have you jump in here for something you might not know, but I know that you're connected to that group. I, I would think that it would be uh, more a cost issue. Yes, sir. Uh, it is. It's, it's basically, a, I, I don't want to say 50-50 because I don't have the exact numbers, but the ones that I talk to when I do speak to them, they either work and their paycheck goes to pay for the insurance only, and that's why they are working to pay for the insurance, or they do not carry the insurance because they cannot afford it because they're the sole provider for the family. Thank you. So we can do some more analysis on that. Um, it just just hey, recognize that anything we do there is going to cost yeah, some money. Yeah, uh, and yeah, I understand. Hey, Jeff, you know you're the resident uh, insurance guru. How do you, how does the district address a certain set of employees to help? Um, I, mean, I don't know. I don't, how does that look? You know, is there a way to like supplemental insurance or something, or give them something, right? Or well, they're usually companies like large companies that have um, lower lower paid employees, like a wide ber uh, girth of employees. Um, under under the Affordable Care Act, we had to provide what they call MEC plans, minimum essential coverage plans, and they're about 120 bucks a month. But they provided the 10 essential coverages uh, for uh, those employees. Now we we're not we're not in we don't have that issue, but that would be a plan that's outside of TRS. And I don't know how that would really look. You know, I don't know that we could even do that, but like David said, you know, we could look at our ancillary coverage, uh, through whomever it might, what companies, you know, Transamerica or whomever, uh, colonial, whatever, you know, those guys and, um, you know, figure out what it is we can do about providing, like critical illness coverage and, you know, hospital confinement coverage and things of that sort, but there's still a cost associated with that. And what, you know, what I've seen over the years is that the lower, lower paid employees of a company, regardless of the company, whomever it is, 
they just really don't see a value in it. Uh, they don't want to spend, uh, you know, $120 to somebody that makes $10 an hour is a significant number. <coughs> so they wouldn't pay for it anyway. And then the district would wind foot in the bill for the whole thing. I just did the calculation. It's about $132,000, which isn't that much for a district our size, but I just took the other 1,100 employees that were not on the plan and, you know, just multiplied it times $120. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, Mr. Moody, Mr. Moody, it would be interesting to know why, you know, just to, like I said, the survey to figure out, okay, this person's taking insurance because their spouse, this person's, it's not affordable just to, so we can gauge and move forward because we, we identify the problems. Maybe we can help out a certain group of people in the future if we're going to, because I'm all for what Jeff said, just trying to contribute more in, in, because it, it's the way it looks. It, it shows that we care. It shows you know, a multitude of things. And so I'd be interested in seeing something like that. That's doable. I'll, I'll look into it. Okay, Mrs. Carter, the floor is yours again. Thank you. Okay, moving on to um, some of the non-payroll budget changes. So um, over the last year, we've been very aggressive in renegotiating a lot of our, a lot of our contracts. Our electricity is uh, a major one and it's planning to take effect um, in June, the new rate. I can't remember the percent decrease off the top of my head, but it's gonna generate a lot of savings. Um, we've been uh, contact, uh, you know, with workers comp, we're going to be bringing it to the board next month. We're going to be expecting some savings as well, copier contracts, you know, a uh, variety of different contracts that we've been re renegotiating uh, pretty aggressively. And so we're looking into having a lot of savings there. Um, we've also included some uh, startup costs um, for, um, for, for different initiatives that we have out there. As we know, the bond program did a lot for us, but now the general fund's starting to have to carry on with the recurring uh, expenditures, right? Uh, welding and the, and the culinary program, you know, CTE programs, um, they need funding for, for their supplies or materials, so uh, we're providing some funding there. Uh, we're also allowing uh, this year for, for the campuses to roll over uh, up to 10% of their budget because they kind of ended up, uh, the year um, early. They have quite a quite some money left over and I don't want them to spend it just for the sake of spending it. I want them to spend it if they really need it. But if this incentivizes them to carry it over to next year, I'm allocating uh, about 10% for next year and that's about $250,000. Band and drill team uniforms. This is about the time that we need to uh, rotate them. So that's about 150,000. And then we are putting some other money into um, new reading academy, some dyslexia requirements, uh, bilingual program requirements, and pre-K program requirements. Of course, you know, throughout the year, as we are looking at the real picture of our revenues and how many kids actually showed up and under what program or what have you, we're able to adjust uh, our budgets. So this is what we have right now for the non-payroll um, changes. So in a nutshell, I am very pleased, at least as a starting point, to present to you a balanced budget. A um, huge goal of ours. And so um, our revenues um, with the one extra golden cent and the increase at the 3.5% uh, property values were 188.3 million and our estimated expenditures 188.3 million. So as, as, uh, as of right now with the positions that you approved at last board meeting with the proposed 4% increase and the propo proposed $25 uh, additional contribution towards the medical premiums, uh, we're looking at a balanced budget. Um, Dr. Jamie, can I jump in and ask a yes. question real quick? Going back one slide on the non-payroll budget changes, um, as we did budget requests from different campuses and principals over the year, were there any outstanding requests um, that seem significant in value that are not included in this, um, in this slide? 
So the most significant are here. Uh, a lot of them, and I'm about to reach out to them this week, is that if I can fund them with this year's budget, and I tend to do this around this time of the year, I fund them uh, ahead of time, especially if they're one-time cost. Um, as far as uh, there could be poten potential um, increases to our software costs, because if we're delivering uh, instruction remotely, of course, we may be seeing some additional costs in the future that are not already here. So yes, we look at the, uh, at the request even from last year, whatever we didn't fund last year. We look at it uh, throughout the year. Some of them change, some of them end up being not needed, um, and some of them they still have a, a legitimate need for them, and we're able to fund, find the money towards the end of the year through uh, savings that we may experience in the payroll side and be able to reallocate some of those funds. Uh, same thing with this year, we didn't have extensive requests. I do have a, a list that I'm still looking over them and a lot of them I'm gonna try to fund them with this year. So that's the conversation that I'm gonna have with the campuses and departments. And the technology piece, um, the software and any equipment needs coming through, is there, we haven't really seen an update with the budget for bond money allocated towards technology and like that 19 million. Is any of that equipment and um, software coming from those funds? Um, not to my not to not to my knowledge. I'll check with uh, Greg, but I don't believe so. Last um, month, you saw us bring an agenda item to buy um, laptops, mm -hmm. about two hundred thousand dollars worth of laptops. Mm -hmm. um, that was not through bond funds. It was through the capital projects fund that we had established. Hopefully, we'll be able to get reimbursed for a lot of the costs that we've already been uh, spending because of the change to remote learning. Right. Um, so that's pending to be seen. Uh, we're, we're working on that. We're working with TDIM um, in uh, uh, submitting our costs to see if we can get them reimbursed. But, um, you know, as again, as the year progresses, the coming months are going to determine a lot of what we're going to be needing to do technology wise. And so that's going to be a big conversation, especially with any learning management systems uh, and any equipment that we may need for uh, our students. Can we see a report of where the technology bond spending is and what's happening with that? Would you mind? Is that a possibility for a future I'll, board meeting? I'll work with, uh, with our technology uh, department. Great, thank you. thank you. Okay, um, so yay, balanced budget. Maybe not for too long, but at least for now. Um, now, our fund balance policy, of course, is to maintain a yearly fund balance, which provides at least 25% of the total operating expenditure. So for next year, we're, we're projecting 188.3 million in expenditures and adding about 3.5 million um, so far that I think we're going to have in surplus for this year. We're looking at a fund balance of 62.1 million, putting us at a 33% um, uh, rate. I'm very comfortable with this, and I'm very comfortable with uh, the salary package and the benefit package that we are uh, proposing, because it's not going to hurt us this next year, and we'll, we still have a lot of cushion uh, for the years ahead, thanks to the fund balance that we have been uh, diligently uh, bringing up. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Decker? That 33%, how many days in the operating fund is that equivalent to? Um, that is about, so 25% is 90 days. So it's about 111 more or less. Okay, so we actually have increased it then. Yes. As opposed to, to taking from it. Yes. Because that's, we were actually planning on dipping into it this past year. We're planning uh, on dipping it. The, the last, uh, the last uh, revenue uh, amendment that I, that I brought actually showed uh, a positive fund balance. And so now that we're starting to dwindle down and we're starting to see the salary savings and perhaps a lot of other savings like um, utilities, right? The, the campuses are not operating. So we should be able to see a lot of savings in utilities and other costs, uh, transportation costs, you know, to, um, extra duty, um, all these other costs. So we are looking to ending the year possibly even better than a 3.5 million surplus hopefully okay. better than that um, my other my other concern is if the state sees that we have this extra money 
Is there a, <laughs> well, that was I, mean, I don't want them, you know, I don't want them coming saying, okay, districts that have this much, we're not going to help you. You know what I mean? So and that is one is of the reasons potential for that. Yeah, that's what it does. I didn't want to put it here because I didn't want to confuse you, but there's two types of fund balance, right? There's a total fund balance and then there's the unassigned fund balance. So what the state looks is that they look at the unassigned fund balance. From this fund balance, we uh, can target, and I can bring it to you guys in, uh, in June, uh, specific um, uh, projects, like let's say we reserve some money for future construction needs, or uh, perhaps we want to reserve some money for the, the outcome of the, of the new legislative session. Uh, to help us carry us throughout the year. So we start assigning some of that fund balance. And so our, what, what TA looks at is that unassigned fund balance. How much do you have in there? So last year, uh, remember, um, thank you again, uh, because we were able to establish a capital projects fund. So right now we're able to uh, proceed with some major capital uh, expenditures that we would otherwise not be able to uh, to be doing. So we have that. We can we can uh, towards the end of the year we can put inject a little bit more money into that capital projects fund and and uh, lower that uh, percentage. But how much in in a time of uh, uncertainty for the next biennium? I would uh, I I would be careful to set too much money aside for the capital projects. Uh, and, and look more into just within the general fund, how we assign it and how we commit those funds. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, now. Hey, Jordani. Yes. Hey, Jordani. Question from JB and yes. then Mr. Barry and then Mr. Bob. Yeah. Hey, hey, Jordani. I really like that whole 33% uh, deal. That's, that's a great idea and I appreciate you doing that. Um, I just want to be clear, though, that 4% suggested payroll increase uh, raise is, is built into your numbers. Is that correct? Yes, yes okay. it's built great. into my uh, payroll uh, budget, mm -hmm. along with the prior slide that you saw some savings and you saw some additional okay. costs. Those are all yeah. built. The next okay. slide is not built. Um, I'm sorry, any other questions before I jump into nope. this one? No, I'm good. Thanks. Mr. Bodkin, do you have a question? No? Okay. I'll, I'll wait till after uh, you get done. Perfect. Uh, thank you. This next slide is the staff, some, some of the staffing requests. I believe HR is still going through the list uh, of requests. These are just some of the ones that I included here. Um, in no particular order, but there, there are some needs. Um, this slide also differs from the one that you had because I erroneously put two occupational therapists instead of two speech therapists. So I just wanted to bring that up to your attention. Um, so. Georgiani, you want me just to. Yes, kind of yes, here? go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, Georgiani said it right. That's the main thing I wanted you guys to know. This is a work in progress. So this is um, what you're seeing here is kind of like the best that we could, we could do right now for, for this budget workshop. But in reality, there's um, in HR, we had two focuses this year. I think they're aligned with uh, what the superintendent wanted. This one was to pay attention to our pre-K because um, you know every dollar that we're spending to pre-K is significant. And so you'll you'll see the aides up top, and you'll see the teachers there in human resources. Both of those, uh, the aides right now, I suspect by the time it's over with, and we're watching our class enrollment. It's just really hard for us to predict what that's going to look like. But I would guess that those aides are going to grow. Uh, the teacher, the, the three teachers you see there are the, in the past years, I've asked you for a bucket of teachers that we could respond to enrollment needs. And so really that's what that is. Those are, those are put there right now. Um, so that down the road, if a elementary teacher, uh, their classroom enrollment goes from say 24 to 25 or 23 to 24, and we're looking at it, we want to be able to respond quickly to that. So those FTEs will come online with enrollment. Uh, the rest of those positions, for the most part, the second priority we had um, in talking to Dr. Kelly was the student support counselors. Um, we have two right now in the junior high, so to add two more would get us in a position that all of our secondary campuses at this point have student support counselors. And I think that that was our end goal 
um, that we would reach that this year for student support counselors in our district unless uh, there's more discussion about that. The rest of those positions, and I have Lisa online, Dr. Nixon is online, I think, to jump in here if need be, but what I want you to know about those positions and talking to her, uh, we spent numerous uh, conversations with her and George Annie. Uh, those funds right now are her funds. Those are federal dollars that uh, Lisa is spending right now and has been spending throughout the year. She came to us months ago, and then we had a, a meeting, I guess, about a month ago with George Annie. And we all agreed that um, what she was doing is using her funds for our funds for contract services. And what her request was, rather than using these funds for contract, can she turn them into positions? Uh, and, in, and in doing so, I think she comes across uh, actually saving some money. So that's not new money. That is federal money that's been in her bucket, and she just wants to use it differently. Um, and there are definitely needs there. Um, Lisa, if you want to jump in there and talk about those real quick, the one position that I will be bringing forward in May at the board meeting would be uh, the vision teacher. Lisa, you want to jump in? Yes, thank you, Mr. Moody. Um, what we've been doing, um, we definitely have the need for speech therapists and occupational therapists. Um, as our enrollment continues to grow, our student needs continue to grow. And so what we're finding is that we're spending such a significant amount money on contract services because it costs so much more than what it would actually cost to have the FTE. So what I'd like to respectfully request is that we're allowed to um, hire these positions. Again, just transferring my money that I typically spend on contracting speech therapist and occupational therapist and actually be able to hire full-time staff. And then the last you'll, you'll see there for consideration, um, I just want to point this out because uh, one of the years prior, maybe last year, um, we brought some items forward later in the year and, and the question was, why wasn't this involved in the additional personnel? So one of the biggest challenges that we have in HR when it comes to this position, uh, this, this decision, is one, right now we spent $950,000 on pre-K. Uh, that's not typical that we would do that. Uh, so everything else that came in play uh, we just felt like we had spent a lot of money. But if the funds are available, I want you to know that almost every request that comes forward to HR, we feel like they're, they're meaningful. They need them. And uh, one of them is the translator. Um, they're a truancy position there slash attendance clerk. Let me tell you a little bit about that real quick. We have, um, we've had a grant for the past three years uh, that supported uh, two truancy positions, one at Pearland High School and one at Dawson High School. And I've heard from numerous people, from Susan Holloway, I've heard from uh, John Palumbo, from Ms. Weimer, and uh, recently from uh, Mr. Berger that those positions made a big, big impact. What happened is the grant has run out. And so we, we're at a position right now of, are we going to can carry these positions forward or not uh, at Pearland High School in Dawson? Because the grant money runs out, we have to put it back in to, and weigh it against every other position that would come forward to the board for approval. Uh, the translator is something that has been discussed. I've been here in this, in this position for a while now, and it's come up several times. It most recently came up through our culturally responsive committee and uh, where we're, you know, we're kind of reaching out, trying to reach out and brainstorm how can we reach our community, uh, how can we reach our employee base. And so the translator within the communication department has been an option. I will tell you that we are hiring, uh, you'll see soon, um, a specialist that took the place of Ms. Marshall. Um, fortunately, right now, I feel really confident with this, this individual, she is bilingual. And so what we're gonna do initially is we're going to look at her as paying her as a stipend, a smaller amount, and see what she can do to support this, um, this issue in our district. It would be more of a marginal support, uh, just simply in communications department. But I think it's um, something we wanna take a look at. It's, it definitely would cost to be cost effective. But if it doesn't work, then down the road, the translator might be an issue maybe next year. Separate from that that you won't see, I want you to know, um, I've, I've spoken with Nyla Watson. She's got a concern with a reading program that's coming forward uh, that she's you know, concerned about who's going to take care of uh, all the work. So she had asked for a reading specialist. Um, we have a growing department with our bilingual and our dual language department. Um, and so Dr. Franco has asked for three clerical positions to support not just her department, but really to support the campus and the teachers because our teachers, as you know, they do a lot of legwork on, um, on documentation. 
And so her concern was more about getting them back into a spot where they are spending more time teaching students. So those are the main issues right now. Uh, I'm open to any questions you have. We've got two questions out, one from Sean and one from, uh, excuse me, one from uh, Mr. Murphy and one from Mr. Bakken. Mr. Murphy, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the question I have, um, you know, um, is my concern is the, the continued COVID stuff and what type of, um, you know, I look at the translator and, and, and the $85,000 salary for a translator, and that kind of has a little bit of sticker shock to me. But my bigger concern is what support are we going to have if, we, if we're in an environment where we do have to go into um, a curriculum of online academics and things like that, since we've gotten, at least I've gotten a lot of feedback from parents, you know, regarding the online and the support. I mean, it's, it, I guess it, I don't see anything in here. I see the counselors and I see the other things, but what support are we going to bring either to the curriculum, to the technology, something to if we have to go into this to give better support to um to the parents that are you know that are struggling to kind of have to do homeschool i mean that's i understand the other stuff i again the district translator is a little bit of sticker shock to me at eighty five thousand dollars for a salary a salary i mean a uh, translator in the communications department um but what what support are we going to provide around if we do have to go into um, a continued COVID, you know, so let, online. John, let me type try, of deal. Yeah, let me try to answer that real quick, uh, the best I can on the on the translator on the sticker shot part. Uh, that eighty five is what I consider tax tied on license. So a counselor, when we, when the board asked us to start looking at when we do a budget impact, that we bring you that market that you know that uh, uh, market uh, salary. And so, you know, just to give you an example, if I'd have brought you forward a counselor, they're, they're coming in, a, a counselor is getting paid around 75000 So it's not too far off. It might be a little heavy. Uh, it depends on who we hire. And if they're a beginning translator, then you can see that number actually coming in at a number around 70 to 75. Um, in terms of the next question you had about what's next, uh, Dr. Kelly, just, just uh, yesterday, we started talking about uh, a committee that we're putting together for a back to, it's kind of a back to work committee. And I think our first meeting will be next Monday and there's quite a few people on that. And so I would anticipate that if we're going to start looking at those type of concerns that you mentioned, like um, what's unexpected right now, I think that will come forward in that discussion and that might be an opportunity for us to bring back a different need. Yeah, we uh, I, I agree with you that it could, be, it could be something that we're not seeing right now that the committee says we need to take a look at this and we might bring something back to you. Yeah. Well, I think I think ending the year, and I'll let you. I'm sorry, Dr. Kelly, but I'll, I'll just make my, my last comment. But I think I think like you said, you know, we're flying a, a plane without any lessons, or you know, we've kind of thrown this together at the end of the year. I guess my concern is if we are probably going to possibly have to plan for this, then this would be the time to get you know, I guess the proper people in place to support online. You know, people with with experience or, you know, that, that can lead this um, would be my only question again. And I would see that as a bigger need than possibly, you know, some of these other positions that we're bringing in, because, you know, I, I know that parents have really struggled, um, you know, through this process and, and it's just because no one's been used to it. And it's, it's new to everyone. So. Yeah. I just add that um, <clears throat> What we hear loud and clear from parents with regard to online learning is to get to one platform, and uh, <clears throat> we're going we're working towards that direction. Whether that costs more money or whether there actually might be some savings in the sense of moving away from one to another, uh, Mr. Barté would have a much more clear answer. But that is one area where, for sure, we want to be there by fall. Uh, <clears throat> we see the fall as being necessarily robust and comprehensive with regard to distance learning uh, in view of the possibilities with the COVID situation and basically mimicking and moving towards what higher education already has in place. Higher education, in, uh, now of course, we're talking the difference between a first grader and a 12th grader, but for at least the higher grade levels, whole degree plans now in, in higher education are totally online. And so we need to move in that direction and it really enhances us, even if uh, COVID-19 does not occur uh, into the fall. 
then all these supplementary services that we've been learning over the last couple of months and continue to build towards are going to be of great help to us. Uh, from a budget point of view, you, you're right, um, uh, Sean, that there are unanticipated things that will probably come up over the next few months. George, Annie, and I have been talking about that a little bit about what do we do there? And we'd probably be invading our fund balance to a certain extent as we find out more what COVID-19 requires of us or distance learning or some of these other things. Uh, uh, just questions for uh, Lisa, Lisa Nixon. Um, we have, uh, okay, so you're, you're wanting, we, we were contracting our speech paths, mm -hmm. correct? And you want to not contract them anymore and go in-house, correct? Yes, sir. We have four speech pathologists that we contract with now. Um, they don't all Jeez, I'm sorry, time. Beat, that, beat that number up. You broke up. What was that? I'm sorry. We have four altogether that we're currently using. Um, we don't work full work weeks. And so we believe that by going to two full time, that will handle most of the load. And then we'll still have funds available to contract additional speech paths as needed. So, okay. Let me get this straight because you kind of broke up and maybe it's my connection. Uh, we have how many speech pathologists do we have to service our district? Now, all together or just the ones that are contracted? Uh, all together and then the ones that are contracted. I think, Lisa, we have about 19, I'm thinking. Okay. Speech paths. Yes, sir. Those are the full time and then we have mm -hmm. that we're contracting with. She said four, God, I can't, she said four, she contract, I'm sorry. That's okay. Mr. Moody, are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you. Uh, we have 19 FTEs in speech for speech pass, and, and Dr. Nixon's saying that she contracts out for additional four right now that don't work a full time, and so she's wanting to. Oh, okay. Uh, so, and, and that two will bring us all the way to all the full time, correct? Not quite. Um, still need to contract speech and part of that is because we do what's called proportionate share that we have to provide a certain amount of our federal funding to support private schools and our does that through speech services like for St. Helen and other private schools so we'll still continue to use contract services for that specific um, portion of the speech services we provide in a private setting. And on your occupational therapist how many do we have in our district and I know you're looking, you're asking for one more to be, uh, but we contract that or explain that a little bit more in depth for me, please. We have three currently and we're contracting one more. Um, it's really difficult. Our numbers are continuing to grow. You know, as our special ed students come, they come with lots of needs. And so uh, we'd like to have a full time occupational therapist because it's very expensive to contract. And so with this additional, it's going to help kind of equalize the caseload for all of our occupational therapists, and there should not be a need to do any contract services. Okay, thank you. I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, any other questions with uh, staffing requests? If not, I, this is I, had a, I had a question since we're on this uh, subject. Had there been any conversation? I saw the earlier slide we talked about HB3 dyslexia requirements. Had there been any conversation on uh, making those half positions we have at at least some of our schools, at least the elementary schools, uh, hiring additional dyslexia specialists so that we have a full time person at that campus all the time, kind of like we're doing with the junior high uh, student support counselors? Lisa, is that question for you? Yeah, the, the, well, I can say the, to answer it real quick, Charles, yes, we've had discussions on that. Um, that was part of, uh, you know, we had a long lengthy meeting with Dr. Nixon about needs. And so that is something that is, we're looking down the road. I, I, the way we looked at it in HR is, and I talked to Lisa about this, she, she did ask again on the positions that you don't see behind the scenes, we asked for an additional two positions for dyslexia support. Um, our thought on that right now, in terms of weighing, again, you know, it, it becomes one of those things where wh 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 what is the importance, what is the cost? And so what we would want to look at, and I told Lisa, it might be better 
for us to come back in next year with a mission just on what you just talked about, Charles. Do we want to go across the board and make these halves a whole rather than taking kind of a, a nickel and dime approach along the way? So my thought is right now within HR is that we could bring that back as a full item next year. But yes, I think the need is there. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. President, if I can make one more comment while we're here. Of course. Um, I am in, I don't know where the rest of the board stands, but I'm in full support of moving forward with the additional student support counselors and the truancy and attendant clerk for student outreach. Um, I'm with Sean and I think from the note with Mr. Moody, seeing how the translator or the new position works out in communication and then moving from there um, seems like a good plan to me. Um, and then the aides as needed, of course, for pre-K, I'm on board with moving forward with that as well. Yes, if I could just weigh in real quick, again, this document will look pretty different the next time we do a budget workshop. So we didn't have the anticipation. The only, the only position out of this that we really wanted to make sure that you knew about because we'll be bringing it for approval to the next board meeting would be the, the vision teacher. The rest of those positions, you'll, we'll, we'll have another uh, budget workshop, I'm sure. It'll change a little bit and then we can have a, uh, additional discussion. like I mean possible um, you know talking about the vision of technology you know uh, Mr. Murphy and Jeff touched on it maybe earlier um, the vision of where we're going with technology um, I know it's going to be of creating a, um, a committee to you know about the COVID-19 but minus that you know because it's going to completely change our landscape and, and and what I'm saying is, even with the student support counselors, um, you know, during this time, you know, you have to think about like, can they have, you know, is there a, a line where a student could reach out to uh, one of those counselors and have a one-on-one -on -one possible Zoom meeting or, or a, a video conferencing to, to help a child that, that is struggling with everything going on. And, and even outside of that, even if we get back to normal, you know, we're going to be changing our landscape with, with teaching in general. There could be some conference calls with parents via these types of meetings right here. Um, you know, all those types of things. What we're doing now is going to be adaptable to uh, when we go back to uh, what do you call normalcy, if you will. But I, I think there needs to be some sort of vision of what direction we're going and not to say, you know, I, I guess I'm a little frustrated with technology because we're, we spent $22 million and I'm still haven't seen the, and Jeff and I talked about it, the vision of where we're going and now it's in front of us. And I just want to see what that looks like, you know, quickly, you know, how, how, what direction are we going and let's make some decisions and this is what we suggest and let's move forward. And instead, you know, so anyway, I'll uh, stop talking, but I, I definitely like to see something like that. I don't, I don't know if we're asking for responses to that. There, there's not right now an answer to that. I would say uh, professionally, we, we as the whole world are licking our wounds uh, with this move to online instruction that not everybody was necessarily uh, ready for. Uh, Parallel ISD was in a good spot with the resources our teachers had. I think part of the problem and part of the frustrations that the parents and the teachers are experiencing is we have a plethora of systems that we are using. Uh, as a district, the vision you're talking about, we need to sit down and CNI and technology are doing that right now as we're all learning from this. What is the best student learning management system? Uh, which direction do we need to go into, uh, go in forward as a district? Do we need to stick with Seesaw and Canvas? And those do work and uh, eliminate all the extra things that other teachers are doing. Because you may have a team of teachers, say you have four teachers and three of them are using Canvas, but one of them decides to use Class Dojo. Well, that mixes the message for the community and the teachers. So we need some sense of accountability from our vision. Once we develop our vision and say, this is the direction we're going in, we need to hold the district and the teachers and the communities accountable that this is what we're doing. 
we are using Canvas and we're gonna teach you how to use it. We're gonna allow the kids to become re robust in the system. We need to put the supports in place to make sure that they understand if there is a problem, but ultimately we need to decide where we're going, how we're gonna get there, use the hardware and software to support that, but in the end, never forget that the student and the learner are the most important to touch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Berger, that explained it exactly. <laughs> okay, um, so any other questions on general fund? I'm gonna move on to debt service real quick and uh, we should be wrapping, it, wrapping this up pretty soon. Okay, so with a debt service, with the current uh, tax rate, if it remains unchanged, we're projecting $35 uh, million dollars, um, in local revenues. That also includes interest earnings, um, as well as you know, prior year delinquent tax collections, et cetera. And about $714,000 from the state for a total of $35.7 $35. $35. million in revenues. Um, as it stands right now without, without refunding um, the bonds that, that uh, I will be discussing, we have a debt service requirement of 34.2 million for this next year, which um, turns out to be a 1.5 million uh, revenue um, uh, surplus projected for, for the year. Um, in talking to John Roebuck, he feels Pretty comfortable with this he doesn't feel um, like we should be reducing our, our tax rate because we do need that fund balance um, and uh, you know to to meet our our, um, our rating requirements especially if we're going to be refunding the bonds um, so this next year this is the current outstanding bonds that we have. Uh, you probably can see it a little bit bigger on your document that I provided to you at the, the printout is towards the back. But those that are in gray, we're able to, uh, they're callable on, on February 15th. Um, this one is, a t uh, the last one is a taxable series bond, so it can be ca callable now. So we're looking at those four, um, four bonds, which would, generate about 11 point, I didn't include it in the presentation, but I believe it's about $11.7 million in savings. Um, yes, ma'am, that's what, that number was in our materials. Okay, perfect. In interest savings, yes, ma'am, that's all Um I'm gonna talk, I don't wanna dive too much into it right now, I'd rather do it in, in June, but I will be bringing you the schedule of events in June of when everything has to happen for us to be able to uh, refund those bonds, which um, are a total of $81.9 million. And we would be generating about 11.14% in present value savings. Moving on to the food service budget, our revenues and expenditures are- um, Mrs. Carter, like may, may I interrupt you please? Mrs. Carbone had a, a question I think about the bonds. Yes. I do. I have some questions about the debt service fund budget and um, what is the current debt service fund budget balance? When, when I look at the, at, the, at the balance, I really can't tell you what it is as of June 30th. I have to give you what it is as of August 16th because whatever we have in our, in our balance right now has to cover our August 15th interest payment, right? And so when I deduct that, we're looking at, uh, without the numbers right on my hand, approximately $12 million, okay? We don't start generating tax collections on, on debt service. Our revenue doesn't come in until December, January, February. Mm -hmm. So uh, we rely on having a good fund balance for the remaining of the, of the calendar year. Um, until when our revenues start coming in. Okay, so in previous budgets that I looked at, our fund balance um, debt to debt to fund balance ratio, like in fifteen sixteen, was about fifty eight percent. In nineteen twenty, was about sixty six percent. And it looks like we're suggested with that one point five million dollar growth going up to about sixty eight percent fund balance to the ratio of what our debt is. 
And I'm wondering if it might not be prudent to talk about lowering this at least a cent if we want to go forward with the TRE discussion, that gives us even a bigger cushion there to have that offset of um, tax rate increase to our citizens so that therefore it gives us a little bit more movement on that TRE side. There is the possibility, but it wouldn't be um, a huge drop. We're already with the, with the way we structured the tax rate for this year, it allowed us to keep it at a five cent total increase rather than the seven cent that we had proposed when we went for, for uh, the 2016 bond, right? And so doing this right now allows us to stay at the five cent margin. Um, I will have to get with, uh, with John Roebuck, uh, who's our financial advisor, mm -hmm. um, at least for the next uh, budget workshop so he can elaborate a little bit further with all the intricacies of, of the bonds and then we can uh, but the fear is if we lower it we may be only lowering it for one year and then moving it up next year however we just heard that uh, at least right now that uh, the property values are going up Right. Uh, a lot more than what we projected. So this right. changes, I have to re do a whole recalculation. Right. Um, it's not as easy as with the general fund that I could get, give you on the spot, more sure. or less how that impact would be. Sure. I have to do a, an entire uh, recalculation to, to see how this uh, may have a potential impact in decreasing the INS tax rate. Okay, I'd really That's like um, some more information as we move forward with this about the potential, especially that we do have such a healthy fund balance in the debt service side, um, that when we re, it seems to me that just a few years ago that there was um, a reorganization of the bonds to get a lower tax rate then, and then we even had a lower uh, percent ratio than we do now. And so it seems like we could really take benefit of that one cent to offset if we are looking for a higher TRE than the five. And even if not, I mean, even if not, the one cent I think is still on the table for discussion right. that we're moving into a place where our taxpayers need the relief more than ever. So even if we don't pursue the, it seems like it might be prudent just to have that discussion if you guys are open to that. Yes, I mean, especially with uh, with the most recent news from this morning. So I think that there there is room for that. Um, I just don't want to jump into um, yeah. telling you what that looks like without recalculating um, the scenarios. Understood. And you get that notification that the nine point two million that 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 official notification will be in June that you get that or well, next month. We get the certified estimates April 30th. They're in the mail. We're going to get them anytime soon. Um, then on July 25th, that's the deadline that the, that the um, appraisal districts have to provide the certified uh, values, the net certified values. And so then our tax rate is actually not adopted until after we get those values. But for budgeting purposes, because we're a June 30th uh, year-end school district, we have to estimate this. So we'll go by the estimates, but then the true uh, adopted tax rate doesn't come until after we get the certified values. Uh, Crystal, one other point. Uh, Georgiania and I have talked about basically the idea you've put forward. And as she said, you know, initially, our initial response was it's not worth it, that the amount of the INS decrease is not, is not great. But that does stay on the table. Um, I, I can't remember which year it was, but it's been in the last three or four years. We did essentially employ what you're saying. We used fund balance to drive down the INS rate so that the taxpayer saw an equivalent or a lower rate. And so we're, in essence, we're trying to be tactical about when to use that particular weapon. So far, what looks much better and more promising is that tax compression is so significant mm -hmm. that it accomplishes what you're after, which is a lower tax rate to the uh, to the taxpayer, particularly if we go forward and ask for a TRE. So it is in our toolbox. We just didn't see it as a great advantage initially. Now, you know, but would pairing those two things together drive down the rate to the taxpayer even more, so yes. that when but, if we ask for a lar larger TRE, then 
it would hit our yes. M&O rate better without, while still having the healthy fund balance yeah. in the debt side. And that, that's, the, uh, that's the tactical aspect of this is, you know, what works the best. But let's say that it wasn't significant, then hold your ammunition, wait for a year where you need to drive down the tax rate by a little bit, and you've got a little bit of a fund balance available to you to do that. So, you know, both things are in play. And I guess I'm looking at it from a not, I, I understand it from a tactical side. It's very helpful that you explain it that way. And I guess I'm looking at it as a COVID response to a, a taxpayer that I'm going to need every bit of change that I can get to make it through the next um, potential recession that's facing us. Yeah, we see that. But again, our initial was that the the savings to the taxpayer was so minimal that it really wasn't uh, the best way to approach it. It was more through the tax compression method. Understood. But anyway, it, we understand, we, you know, that's a tool in our toolbox. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I think I already discussed the food service. It's pretty straight through. Uh, the next steps, of course, is um, get some direction from you as far as how do you feel about uh, the proposed salary increase and benefits so that we can start building um, a solid um, expenditure budget. Um, we should be getting our certified values um, this week. Again, uh, the final certified values are not going to be here until July 25th. At the end of July, beginning of August, TEA is gonna conduct a survey and basically request this information and then they're gonna to provide to us what the compressed tax rate uh, will be. We're pending to review additional campus and budget requests, both uh, on the payroll and non-payroll side. Every day monitoring the COVID pandemic um, to see if there's any effects that we need to immediately take, um, any action that we need to immediately take for this budget. And, uh, and of course, you know, with, with us being a June 30th fiscal year, we almost always expect the values in July to change a little bit from our projections, hopefully to, um, a, a, on a positive note. And so we do amend the budget um, every once in a while as, as it is required. Um, any input as far as what I mentioned regarding uh, what direction to take as far as um, compensation package is concerned? Well, I just like I'm good with the suggested limit. Okay, I just like to just give an overall comment, which is um, we. We're happy to have built a, a balanced budget. That's been a real challenge for us over the last few years. The caution that we're also employing at the same time is that we know the next biennium is gonna be real rough. So we wanna make sure that we don't make commitments now that we can't sustain uh, into the next biennium. Uh, I've been there before in 2008 with a recession, and come back with, the only way to significantly cut a, a school district budget is, is personnel. And so um, I think Georgiani has achieved a good balance here. And, and, but we also realize that as we go forward in the next few months, particularly with things that we can pull from fund balance, there may be new expenses that are unique to the situation we're in right now with COVID. So, so Dr. Kelly, and Georgiani, um, I, I like the suggested uh, payroll increase. Uh, I also like the idea of increasing the um, the benefit allowance from 250 to 300 versus 275. Um, so, just my two cents for what it's worth. Thank you. If there's any no other comments, then um, I like, you know. I, I've got a couple of. I'm sorry, I was trying thank to. Thank you. Everybody else getting in. Uh, I, I'm I'm fine with the uh, compensation package as far as the raises go. I'm a little. I'm surprised that the uh, the equity adjustments they seem really light. Right? It seems like it's a real conservative. I agree. Uh, yeah, uh, shot at that. 
that mm -hmm. that is because the actual uh, effect of the four percent raise and increasing that control midpoint is twenty five hundred dollars. So that when you have a larger um, salary increase, uh, you would expect that those adjustments are a little bit lower. Okay. As you're moving okay. the, the people up to market, David, anything you want to add? Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is, um, it, again, all this comes down to the decisions of the board and the, mm -hmm. the, the money that's available. There's obviously an opportunity there for us to uh, move even further, be more aggressive with the 15 and the 20 year mark. It, it just takes more money that uh, I can't put a, a number on that, George Annie. I don't know what you would say, but I would think that we would need. Uh, at least the same amount to go back in. If you're trying to truly close the gap um, to to the market, it's going to cost probably another two hundred fifty thousand or up to do that. I can, uh, if you want to put up uh, bringing them up to a hundred percent. You mean a hundred percent of market? Yeah. I can calculate that uh, for the next budget workshop if you're interested in, in knowing and, that. And, and what we would um, have to do there at that point is to make sure that there's no kind of ripple effect to that where, the, you know, once the teacher's salary starts moving, what does that do to the gap between the teacher and the counselor and the counselor and the specialist? And right. there's, there's hidden costs there that we would need right. to be careful about. Right. But um, if, you're, if you're asking for, uh, I want to say my first year in this position and the board uh, that year did a 4% raise, maybe it was 4% raise and gave us another $750,000 for equity adjustments. Oh. Yes. That, yes. That's that reminds me. That we've done that. When we did that, um, that did give us some significant movement to the market that we're after. And uh, in, that, in, uh, in, that, in that time when we did that three quarter million almost, yeah. I remember there were a lot more um, folks yeah. in the ESC that were, it wasn't just teachers. Yeah. yeah. Was, and so, yeah. Uh, you know, not to prolong the, the meeting real quick, but. Uh, that's a very important point you just made, Charles, in that, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about teachers because that is, that's what right. we, that's our first and foremost priority. But the reality of it is uh, <coughs> across the board, when you look at uh, where we are in most of our job families, uh, we could use the adjustment. Keep in mind last year, we gave a 2.5% raise to half of those employees that you're referencing right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there is opportunity there to do equity adjustments and move. We did not do that this year with TASB. I did not ask for that model because that is expensive to do. Mm -hmm. But if that's something that we want to look at, then Georgiani and I would have to get back together and give you kind of a cost to ballpark to that. Dr. Kelly? Yeah, one other thing there, guys. Um, and I, I don't think we mentioned this at all. I've been a little bit in and out during the meeting, but... Um, I definitely want to recommend that as before we adopt this budget, that we add that line into the budget that allows you flexibility at mid-year to grant a uh, one-time payment. Mm -hmm. uh, if you remember that handcuffed us a little bit this past year because it wasn't built in there and there's no guarantees and it is a low level decision so that people aren't counting on it, but um, it is a very valuable tool that we probably could have used this year had we had, we had it in place. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for adding that. Yes, sir. Uh, so yes, I, I would be very interested in seeing uh, what a more aggressive look at the uh, market adjustments looks like. And I know there's a lot of calculus, there's a lot of different things to get you know moved around that you'll have to take a look at. Uh, George Annie, I'm, I was really happy to see uh, Mrs. Carter a, um, a balanced budget because I hadn't seen one mm -hmm. like yet, right? <laughs> and so well, my question was, what was it that tightened up or the additional revenues that allowed us to even consider a balanced budget with like almost you know two hundred million dollars in expenditures. I, I just didn't think that HB three was that good to us, and I don't see it like, wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah, it how, wasn't how it really, it, it, and it's not. It continues not to be. Right. But uh, what it was, of course, you know, this was the first year of HB three, and not knowing what those property values are going to look like until late January, in this case, it was early February because that's when they released the, the values to us. Uh, it's a guessing game, right? And so now that, that the property values were favorable, um, we were in a good spot. We also had a good, very good property value audit from years past. Mm -hmm. And so that helped us tremendously as well. Um, you know, for, for, this, uh, for this next year, 
what I did when I was doing the budget, I did not look at my revenues and my expenditures at the same time. I went ahead and calculated my revenues. Right. Then I went ahead with my expenditures. And then I was like a hundred thousand close. Right. So then I looked for the 100,000 to balance it. But uh, right. it was, it's one of those years. Um, we're a little bit more exact uh, with salaries and knowing what positions were approved last month and what have you. Uh, we were able to do a lot of that. And throughout the year, we've been renegotiating a, a, a ton of contracts that we already know are going to take effect um, this new fiscal year. So that also helped us a lot to uh, fine tune um, those budgets. Um, and, you know, just being yeah. very realistic is a tight budget. And I'm going to say it again, uh, uh, especially on the non payroll side, there is not a whole room of fluff. So if things do emerge and we do need additional expenditures, then we will be coming to you and asking for a budget amendment. So that is one of the things that I do want to stress. Um, we're building it based on what we know right now, um, projecting a little bit more for next year because of HB3, but not necessarily, nobody knows exactly how this COVID situation is going to play out um, yeah, next yeah. year. Yeah, Go ahead, thinking, Dr. Let me add something that, and to Charles' question that may not seem like it's related. You're saying, why are we in this good looking position as we go forward? Uh, one of the things that, that benefited us this year that we weren't expecting were reimbursements, believe it or not, from Hurricane Ike. Yes. Now that's relevant to future years in this way. We are very aggressively pursuing grants in relation to COVID-19 and feel very reasonably assured that we're going to get some money from there. And that so somewhat takes some pressure off of us in the sense that we're, we're going to be made whole in some ways. Um, okay. And so, so it wasn't, it wasn't a, a bunch of cost. We didn't cut out a bunch of costs. We got additional revenues. And yes. so, okay. okay. And my last question was, um, what is our lowest hourly rate wage that we pay? Uh, I wish I could tell you though. I think it's $11 and 20, $11 and 60 cents. I think. Okay. You know that? And I asked because it's, it's been a couple years since we talked about that wage point, And I think we set it to make yes. sure that no one was making. Yeah, it's, it's still, it still moves each year. And yeah. I will say on the study that TASB gave us from uh, when I was, again, mentioning comparing to the 75th percentile, believe it or not, mm -hmm. in our lowest paid employee bank, that's where we actually were very competitive uh, to the 70th percentile. Uh, in a lot of areas we weren't, but in that area we were. Do you have that, Georgini, real quick? 1150. At 1150 is the very, very lowest um, beginning salary. Oh, it's a beginning salary. Okay. It's the very lowest yeah. beginning salary. Okay. Yes. So, but we do have somebody making that in the district now. Should. We should. I mean, as they hire in. You, if, okay. if they just started at that okay. very beginning salary position, perhaps. Okay. All right. If that's market then great, right? But if that needs to be taken a look, if that needs to be adjusted, then, you know, I'm comfortable with that as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, what's a living wage and so forth and so on. And um, we'll, <laughs> yes, we'll look into uh, those adjustments on the non-teacher scale as well and okay. bring something back to you um, on the next budget workshop. Okay. Okay, I've got two hands raised, uh, Mrs. Decker, then Mrs. Carbone. Well, first and foremost, thank you for all of this information and uh, for creating a balance because that, that actually, not, this is my, what, 10th year and this is the first time I've seen that. So that, that is amazing. Congratulations on that. Um, that being said, um, there's a lot that you're going to be bringing back to us. And I guess like I, I'd like to see the, the cost impact that Jeff has proposed as far as the going, you know, what that's going to look like with the um, additional $25 um, to help with the health care on top of if we do increase the equity adjustment. Um, and then, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of going through my head on, on, on all the things that we are going to be looking at next month. Um, but the, uh, the other question I had is, 
you, you mentioned earlier that there's a bunch of savings due to utilities and just different things that because we're not using our school buildings. And then you also said that you're gonna get back with the campuses to see if there's actually things that you can purchase this year with those savings. Is that, or is that something that, that we're well, looking at? For, for the campuses, what I'm doing is that I'm allowing them to roll up to 10% of their budget, so long as they have 10% of their budget remaining for this fiscal year, to roll it up to next year. Oh, and wow. then I'm going back, yes, and then I'm going back to looking at um, what were the requests that were submitted last year, as well as the ones that have been submitted this year, and what can I fund with this year's budget, those things that are one-time costs that I may be able to fund with this year's budget. Uh, that way we're able to accomplish uh, some of the needs that are real needs. And then uh, this other question I have is like Dr. Kelly thinking um, when we talk about our support counselors and I think it's awesome that we're there we're looking at adding the, the, the two to, to service the junior highs. Do is there any talk or um, do we have any expectations that some these four may be able to visit with the five, six campus. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think our mental health issues just stop or, you know, start at junior high. So just, I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. I know it's another huge cost um, to even be thinking that route, but um, you know, we're seeing fifth and sixth graders that are, are also struggling. And, and so I just wanted to know if there's been any talk on that or um, if it's, you know, if this is just, it's just not, it's not ever going to be doable. Yeah. Uh, may I, may I say something, Dr. Yeah. Kelly? Yes. This, um, Yes, the plan is for those junior high counselors, student support counselors, when they are full time, to work with that feeder pattern. So they would awesome. go down to the middle school. That's great. That's good to know. That's very good to know. Okay. That's all for me. Thank you again, Georgiani. This is awesome. And staff. Thank you. Hey, Charles, real quick on that fact to the custodian. Um, the um, market compared to market is 105% right now. So we're in a good spot there. Um, Mr. President, if I may, um, I just wanted to reiterate some of the comments that you made earlier when we talk about a plan for extra funding and that sort of thing and having conversations about topics like block scheduling, um, student teacher ratio, school start times. Um, I know that we have a lot of hurdles to cross before we can ever get there and we definitely want to get through COVID and but I just want to reiterate the importance of the comments from several of the board members about having at least discussions and workshops on those topics. Because I know there's going to be a budget implications of all of those things. All right, we've got some of those things scheduled to be workshops on our board calendar. And I mean, obviously things have just kind of, there's, everything's just an upheaval right now, but you know, we'll get back to, to that schedule. It's, you know, as soon as we can, you know, as soon as it's practical. Uh, but yeah, a lot of that stuff is set to be talked about and we know it's going to have budget implications, but you know, I just piggyback on what you're saying. I mean, it, it can't be a TRE just for a TRE. It's got to be a vision attached to it. And I think those things, uh, even some financial things that uh, Mr. Barry is talking about, you know, that's just got to be part of the vision about what we're going to go out and ask for a TRE for. Yeah. Okay, um, I don't have any other hands raised. Uh, Mrs. Carter, did you have any other great news to share? Um, no, well, again, we're still working through hopefully more getting some more um, funding reimbursements, applying for everything that we can, right, as, as, uh, from COVID. Um, that's all I have. I do want to take the opportunity to thank my staff uh, for helping uh, in this arduous process. Uh, Yvette Rogers, to Pham, Melanie McWilliams, and of course, David's department, Human Resources, um, Sandy, Brittany himself, you know, Victoria, um, helping to put the compensation and benefits back in. It's a lot of work, but um, very happy that um, the board has taken good measures to uh, keep those healthy savings. And so we're in a good position to be able to move forward um, with in increases for, for our staff. All right, uh, is there anything else from any other trustees, any other staff members? Dr. Kelly? No, sir. Um, sure. I
appreciate the board's input today. I think we're all pretty much on the same page. And so uh, I'm excited as we put this together and go forward in the next year. Yeah, we, this, is, this is a landmark, uh, <laughs> this is a landmark budget presentation indeed. <laughs> yes, it is, yes it is. All right, well, with uh, nothing further to come before the board, I will adjourn the meeting at 1.44 p.m. And uh, thank everybody for their involvement. Thanks so much. And if you're seeing Mike, he's saying great job finance. And uh, yeah, so is Crystal, so is Rebecca, all of us. Yeah, thank y'all so much. Thank you. Good job, guys. I know. Thank you.